Hello everyone, I'm Jensen. Today is Friday, February 19th, and as school staff in Ohio continue to get their coronavirus vaccines, it hasn't come without controversy. So I'm here to get you in the loop. Ohio teachers and school staff qualified to get their shots on February 1st. However, in order to get those shots, each school district had to sign on to an agreement with the state to go back to some form of in-person learning by March 1st. So that could be anything from hybrid to fully in-person five days per week. And now the reason that school staff were prioritized and that DeWine added this stipulation to the agreement is that getting kids back into the classroom is one of the key parts of his vaccination plan. But why is this so important? I will get to that in just a minute. But from the beginning, DeWine has gotten a bit of pushback from teachers unions. The Ohio Federation of Teachers, for example, has been very vocal about their position. In a letter to the governor, the union said he was, quote, holding this precious commodity hostage while pitting parents, administrators, teachers, and other school workers and students against each other. Now, the governor's office responded by explaining that DeWine made the requirement in order to most efficiently use the limited vaccine available. And while the vaccine is offered to those districts who said they'd go back by March 1st, ultimately, the decision is up to the district. So in essence, if they don't want to go back, they don't have to sign on to the deal. But all public schools in the state besides one did agree to that March 1st date. And locally, a lot of those plans have already been announced. Just take a look at your screen. A huge chunk of these districts are already back in the classroom, at least to some extent, and the others are not far behind. I have more information on all of these school plans in the description of this video if you need it. Now here's where things get interesting. Although nearly all schools signed on to go back by that March 1st deadline, at least three districts have already announced plans that mean they would go back after that deadline despite already getting their vaccines. Those districts were Cincinnati, Akron, and Cleveland public schools. So let's look quickly at Cincinnati. They were notably the first district to get the COVID-19 vaccine before school staff even technically qualified. Cincinnati School District. <clears throat> Superintendent called me, said, could we start a couple days early? Really want to get kids back in school. And I know she was very sincere in wanting to do that. I said, look, our whole objective is to get kids back in school. This helps you, helps you start with the K through three, which is what she told me. I said, let's do it. And so we just did that. Now, vaccinations have long been complete within the district, but last Friday, the governor said that one of its high schools is expected to stay remote the rest of the academic year, despite their initial promise to return in person. While the governor told districts going back on that promise was unacceptable, one reporter at that same press conference noted that the Cincinnati decision to stay remote was made due to problems maintaining distance within that specific building. But, DeWine said, Well, look, they signed the document. They signed to say they would go back, back in. If we were going to have that discussion. That discussion should have taken place at that, at that time. And Cleveland was an interesting case too. When DeWine got word that their public school district may not return by March 1st either, they were right in the middle of vaccinations. And in a call with the district CEO, the governor asked if they should halt vaccinations in light of that news before he was then promised the district would do everything in its power to return by March 1st. Now, while the optics of that conversation certainly aren't great, especially after the governor was already accused of using the vaccine as a bargaining chip by teachers unions, the governor said that that suggestion wasn't meant to be any kind of punishment. Rather, if those doses weren't going to be used what they were meant to be used for, which was getting kids back into school, they could instead be reallocated to Ohio's most vulnerable citizens. And since last week's press conference, it has come to light that another Northeast Ohio district may not make that March 1st date either. Youngstown City Schools is set to announce its plan next week, and it looks unlikely they'll get back on the governor's timeline. But DeWine made clear that despite them falling off track, everyone who was vaccinated will be able to get their second dose. So right now, it doesn't look like any districts breaking their promise will face any kind of punitive measure besides maybe a few stern words from the governor. But that could be because a lot of schools are already back in the classroom, at least to some extent. DeWine said that in December, 45% of Ohio students were at a school that was fully remote. And now that number has dropped to 15%. But why is this so important? Let's look at the numbers when it comes to performance. According to the 2020 fall enrollment and assessment data, at the beginning of the school year, there was a decrease in enrollment by about 3%, with a high concentration being in preschool and kindergarten age groups. So student performance scores were also lower. In kindergarten, 8% more students were found to be not on track 
and for the state's third graders, about 8% less students scored proficient or better. Almost all districts, 87% had a decrease in this same metric between 2019 and 2020. And let's look at mental health. According to Ohio's Director of Mental Health and Addiction Services, Lori Chris, youth in communities across the state have been presenting more acute mental health symptoms during the pandemic. School is community for kids. It benefits them beyond their academic content. It's the social and emotional connections that kids feel with friends, classmates, extracurriculars, teachers, and more. Chris explained that remote learning is taking its toll on some students. The CDC has recognized that beyond getting sick, many young people's social, emotional, and mental well-being has been impacted by the coronavirus. Chris said that when kids aren't in school, the change of routine and constant uncertainty often produces anxiety. Disconnection from learning, emotional, and social supports can lead to depression. Missed significant life events like proms and sports competitions can also result in grief. Now you should reach out for help if a young person in your life is talking about feeling hopeless, worrying about being a burden, feeling like there's no reason to live, using drugs or alcohol, or engaging in other risky behaviors, struggling with school, or disconnecting with family and friends. But is going back to school safe? Well, according to the CDC, there is now strong evidence that in-person schooling can be done safely, especially in lower grade levels. And new guidance released from the agency last week is targeted at schools that teach kindergarten up to 12th grade. Now here are some of the key things this guidance emphasized, which really will come as no surprise. Mask wearing, social distancing, hand washing, disinfection of school facilities, diagnostic testing, and contact tracing to find new infections and separate infected people from others. CDC officials said that in-person learning has not been identified as a substantial driver of coronavirus spread in the U.S., but they did say that the safest way to open schools is by making sure that there is as little disease in a community as possible. And the push to get kids back to in-person learning is also coming from the White House. President Joe Biden has promised to get at least kindergarten through eighth grade students back into the classroom five days per week by the end of his first 100 days in office. But the president has been caught between competing interests as he works to get these kids back into in-person learning without upsetting the powerful teachers unions that helped him get elected, many of which claim some schools in some areas have failed to make buildings safe enough to return. So we will see if he's able to reconcile these interests to hit his mark by April 30th. But I know that is a lot to throw at you, so I have all of this information ready for you in a link in the description of this video, so check that out if you're interested. But that is all I have for you today. If you like this video, hit that like button, and of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Jensen, and now you are in the loop.